Hello, everybody, and welcome to part one of this Stop Being Afraid of Houdini supplemental bonus lesson on rigid body destruction and debris sourcing and particle workflows. So in the uh, chapter six of the Stop Being Afraid of Houdini course, we specifically devoted that to going over how to get... Um, an animation that we had done of a golf club swinging at a golf ball um, out of Cinema 4D and into Houdini. We did some simulation on it and then export those simulation elements out of Houdini back into Cinema 4D. In the course, we didn't actually go through how we set up any of the simulation stuff. We just kind of worked uh, along with the workflow and then skipped ahead in the project file to you know maintain focus on the workflow aspect of round tripping between the two applications. Um, didn't want to sort of defeat the purpose of the lesson by getting hung up on some gigantic simulation setup. But we thought it would be a good idea to circle back to it at some point because it is uh, something I think people would like to see. Luckily enough for us, the workflow, they've added a couple new options for how we can achieve effects like this in Houdini 18 using the new inline RBD bullet solver uh, SOP and also the inline pyro solver SOP. And then we'll also be using another pop net as well. And we'll be doing this all in one network. So if you have access to the course, and you have access to the project file, you'll be able to see how the, the old way of doing um, the this rigid body setup that I did for the purposes of the course. And then you can kind of compare it to this new way, which I think people find really uh, great. I personally have been sort of on the fence and I kind of joke around with my friends about it, but um, I have not always been a fan of doing things in line in SOPs the way you're about to see me do it in uh, this project, but the more I work with it, the more I think that it actually is really great. So I hope that um, you'll find this interesting. And again, this is just part one. So we're just going to be going over the, our RBD bullet solver in this lesson. And then in the next lesson, we'll be going over how to incorporate that with the pyro solver to kind of achieve a unified effect. Um, and then beyond that, we'll be creating more uh, debris particles and stuff like that. So without further ado, let's dive into Houdini and see how we can uh, use the new RBD bullet solver in SOPS. All right, so here we are in Houdini. We're pretty much where we left off um, when we imported the file from Cinema. We have our animated Alembic in here, our camera move. And then if we jump into our destruction SOP that I've set up here, you can see that we've sort of broken out our um, incoming Alembic into the ball, the club, and the T. And so now we're ready to do our work here. But because of the new workflows that have come out in Houdini 18, it's a really great opportunity to go over the new inline SOP solver or the in, inline pyro solver and the inline uh, rigid body solver uh, because those two were sort of added. Um, I mean, you could always sort of do these things in line, but they've really sort of created um, nodes to do this sort of um, dynamic stuff in the SOPs context in a way that it's a lot more intuitive and a lot of the controls that you'd typically use in a more simple setup are exposed for you. Um, so, you know, previously what we ended up with, this is the end of our previous example. We had, uh, you know, when we, when we were bringing our stuff in from our Cinema 4D project, um, in, in the section where we're going over how to transfer data back and forth between Cinema 4D and Houdini, what we ended up with at the end of that section was um, three outputs like this, where we have done our rigid body destruction, our pyro simulation, and our particles, all sort of in separate object level nodes like this. But for what we're gonna be doing, is using these new inline nodes. And we're gonna work all inside of this destruction uh, node and build all of our stuff down here. So let's get started with that. The first thing we wanna do is we wanna fracture the ball because this golf club is gonna come uh, swinging down and it's going to shatter this sphere. So we're gonna work with shattering first off. And to do that, I like to use the RBD material fracture node. So let's throw down an RBD material fracture. And it always takes a second to think about itself until it is ready to go, and here we are. So we've got a bunch of inputs. Um, we can bring in constraints and proxies and extra Voronoi pieces, etc. And this is a lot like how Vellum is set up now, where you're kind of piping through uh, several separate streams into one node, and then uh, we're doing some work on them, and then bringing the separate streams back out, these bottom ones down here. So I'm going to wire the ball into the first input, that's the geometry, and then we're going to just highlight it and see what it does for us. 
So I zoom in here, you can see that it has kind of added a little bit of a, a Voronoi fracture look to it. And that's sort of the default, what this concrete material type is. There's other uh, glass and wood, but for, I think, just a general destruction, uh, concrete's going to work good for our purposes here. So I'm going to just throw down an exploded view so that we can kind of see what uh, those different pieces look like. And you can see it's just a pretty generic Voronoi uh, fracture pattern. But uh, what we can do is we can actually add some more details to this. So what I like to do is go into this uh, detail tab right here, and then we're going to add some edge detail. If I click on that, you can see that the interior geometry is going to get a little bit more um, polygonalized, and then these edges have been sort of, uh, they're a little bit warbly, warblier now, and you can tell that there's just a little bit more detail. But I want to add just, I just want to tweak this a little bit to make it look a little bit more interesting. So I'm going to bring the detail size down by a half. So let's do a 0 0.025. You can see the poly count's going to increase on the inside here. Then um, I'm going to bring the noise element size down to something like 0 0.05. That's going to kind of uh, make the noise have a higher frequency. So you can see it's really getting chunky. And then um, I want to just reduce the height or the amplitude of that noise a little bit as well. So I'm going to bring that down to 0 0.05. And now you can see we've got some pretty nice little uh, chunks like that. So one of the cool things also about this RBD material fracture is that it's going to give us constraints here, and you can also see an output for proxy geometry. So if I just throw down a null, you can take a look at that. We've got our constraints here. So it's just these are just the glue constraints that are gluing all of our pieces of our fracture together. And then out of the uh, the out of this uh, out of the proxy geometry slot you can see that it is just leaving us with that normal voronoi fracture and actually there's a pretty cool uh, node if i go to rbd exploded view this is a special exploded view that will take all these inputs actually what i'm going to do is i'm going to delete that if i click here and then tape rbd exploded view it'll wire up all three for us automatically it's going to get these out of the way and then we can actually see our high-res pieces, our proxy, and then if we want to, we can even show how the constraints are all connecting them in this nice, cool, exploded view. Cool to know, that node's there. I'm just gonna get rid of it for now. Uh, the next thing that I want to do is add some more detail to this, because if we're looking at our exploded view of our proxy geo, you can see that um, it's, it's very much, it's pretty uniformly distributed. And what I wanna do is I wanna add some more fracture pieces on the side where the golf club is coming through so that it kind of breaks up a little bit more on one end on this end where it's initially being struck by the club so i'm going to do that by adding some more uh voronoi cell points you can see that in this fourth slot is where we're allowed to do that so i'm going to go up here to the ball and i'm going to just create a group uh, based off of the normal direction i'm going to pick uh points in, put points into that group that are most facing into it looks like the positive z direction so let's do a group I'm just going to give myself a little bit more space here. Slide that up. All right, so uh, let's wire this into the first input of the group. You can see it's by default creating a group uh, out of primitives. I'm just going to make a point group instead, and we'll just call this like impact. Uh, impact region, something like that. And I'll remove that slash because I don't want that in there. And instead of using this base group, I'm going to just untick that and then say keep by normals. And then it's already uh, set to point in the positive Z direction. I'm just going to dial the spread angle back. And you can see that those points are starting to kind of stick to that one side. Bring down to a value of something like 20 looks like it's going to work great. So we've got points that are clustered on that side um, entering into this group. Um, but I don't want to just like use these points as the fracture um, points because those are pretty um, uniformly distributed. Um, so let me just turn on my, I'm going to bring up the point size so it's a little bit easier to uh, see. Actually, I don't see, it doesn't look like it's, it doesn't look like it's changing that uh, for me. Let's see if I go to guides and then point marker size. Yeah, bring that up there. You can see those orange dots are in our new group here. So what I'm going to do is actually use uh, what I think, I think it's a newer node, but we're going to create an attribute fall off from this grouped region that we created right here to create our higher density uh, distribution we can scatter onto. So to do that, I'm going to use a node called distance along geometry. And the distance along geometry actually uh, will take in a starting point. So we want our impact region to be the start points. So I'm just going to type that in here for our group. 
and then it's going to output an attribute called dist. And if I middle mouse click here, you can see that it has added that dist attribute here for us. So let's visualize that. I'm actually going to hover over here and then on the wheel, I'm going to hit this I. It's going to bring this up and you can see we have dist here. I'm just going to click it. You can see that it gives us this sort of red, white, and blue fall off for, that, uh, for the distance from that group. Um, and you can see it also appears here in our visualizers. I'm just going to edit this and um, make it go from red to black because I just kind of like... Um, I don't know. I'm old school like that. I like I like my <laughs> I like my attributes to be visualized on a um, on a single color uh, ramp. So I'm just going to set that like that, and you can see that we've got this uh, sort of fall off like that. So now the distance value is increasing as we move away from those points. If we wanted to remap this to a density where our density is higher, actually in this area, we need to kind of reverse this a little bit. So I'm going to create a density attribute out of this distance attribute by using a node called attribute, uh, I think it's attribute remap. Yeah, attribute remap. And this is a cool handy node. Basically, you could do something like this in Vops or in Vex, but um, this node just makes it really easy to do a pretty basic thing, which is take an attribute, which we're saying our original attribute. I'll just select dist, and we're going to create a new attribute called uh, density. You could probably, you, you don't need to necessarily rename this. It'll just update the distance attribute, but since I do want to use uh, some more description, uh, a better description of what's determining our scattering, I'm going to use uh, density here. So um, if I go uh, here, you can see that we have the opportunity to do a range map. And if I open up the geometry spreadsheet, you can see this distance attribute ranges. It looks like something like from zero all the way up to uh, about 0.4. So uh, what I could do is I could set these values manually, but what it actually has for us here is a nice little compute range button. If I click that, it remaps from the input, which is the input minimum of 0 to 0 0.41, and remaps it to itself to an output of 0 to 0.1. And I actually want a, a value uh, from 0 to 1, so I'm going to increase this output maximum. And we can't see anything happening with our visualization in our viewport here because we're not actually visualizing our density attribute anymore. So um, I'm going to uh, actually, in our, in our visualizers here, I'm going to turn off the distance visualizer and I'm going to do the same thing with this one. I'm just going to hit the I and then I'm going to choose to uh, visualize density by clicking on the density attribute here. And you can see that it's given us another visualizer that is red, white, and blue. And I'm going to edit that one as well. And I'm going to do another, let's do another black to red uh, sort of gradient here. So now that we're visualizing our density, and if we look at our geometry spreadsheet, it looks like our density is actually ranging from zero all the way up to one. So it's done, it's effectively remapped that for us, which is good. And then I'm just going to ramp this off since it gives us this remap attribute here. I'm going to uh, sort of, you know, make it higher. Actually, what we want to do is reverse this. We want the density to be higher here and then have it sort of fall off from that point. So I'll just kind of tighten this up like that. And then I'll throw down a scatter. So the whole point of this is if I were to just wire the scatter into the ball, um, it would evenly distribute points all the way around uh, the sphere. But we could provide this density attribute, which will allow it to um, try and cluster those points closer to higher density values. So if I wire that into our attribute remap, and because we chose density as our attribute, it's clustering all of our points down on this on this area. And if I were to try and like kind of redistribute that, you can see how it, it, it kind of clusters them uh, accordingly. Cool. So what I want to actually do, and I don't know what's going on with this right now. I think I kind of, I drifted off of absolute zero here. So I just have to make sure that this is, I have to make sure that this second notch is actually goes down to zero. Otherwise with a little bit of density in there, it'll keep trying to redistribute those points. So let's put a value of zero into that second knot. And then um, I just don't want to scatter as many points. I'm going to put this down to something like 80. And then I like it to be a little bit more random. These are uh, these points have been relaxed, so I'm just going to turn off these relax iterations, and see they're more randomly kind of scattered there. So now, if I put these into the RBD material fracture, highlight the RBD material fracture, it hasn't added any uh, new uh, sort of fracture pieces over here. Um, that's just because we have to enable them. So I'm just going to go back to the primary fracture tab here and just uh, scroll down. You can see that. Under cell points, it gives us the option to throw in our own points, and I'm just going to uh, click that checkbox. It's going to rethink about it, 
and there we go. We get nice, we get some nice gnarly fractures over on that one side, and then they all sort of fade off into more general, larger shapes on the um, in the negative z direction. Cool. Now, uh, because uh, RBD material fracture kind of uh, has to think about it does kind of take a while to cook its results. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw down a uh, node that will cache all this. So it could just do a file cache. Um, but you know what I don't really want to do, I don't want to merge together my geometry and my constraints and my proxies all together into this file cache. That, that doesn't really work for me. So there's actually a specific cache for um, this new RBD workflow, and that's called the uh, RBD IO. So just going to throw it on this RBD IO node, and you can see that it's got little points, little little sections here where it can take in um, it can take in geometry constraints and our proxy geometry and additional simulation points if we have or if we are bringing this out of the simulation, which you'll see in a little bit. Um, so we're only really concerned with caching our initial uh, geometry and constraints and proxy geometry. So I'm just going to do that. All right, so you can see that this node is, um, you know, by default going to be uh, saving next to our hip file into a folder called geo, and then it's going to be the name of the file and the operator string and the frame that we're on. We only want to really save the current frame or the first frame, so I'm just going to roll this back to frame one. You can see that it's got to rethink about cooking this, and that's because there's a time dependency on this because we're importing from an Alembic. So what we could do is if this was being really slow and we were trying to play something back, we could throw it on a time shift. But in terms of doing this, this should um, kill that time dependency for us. So I'm going to save only the current frame, and I'm going to remove the frame from this list. Uh, from from this uh, geometry file because we're only saving the first frame. We're not going to have it change and recalculate every single frame. So um, when I when I change that, I'm going to click. Uh, oh, I want to name this something that makes sense. We're going to call this RBD fracture cache, and then I'll hit save to disk. It's going to save that to disk, and then I'm going to tick load from disk. And you can see that the time dependency badge, this little clock, has gone away off of that node. So we're not like sitting there recooking our RBD material fracture every single, every single frame. If I go and look at my project folder, it has created the geo folder for me, and inside there is my uh, fracture cache. And it's only one file. It's uh, not the, it's not too big or anything like that. It's just one file, and it's got all the constraints and everything in there that we need. Um, and so, well, the thing that's really cool is that we've created our constraints, and we've we've done all this. And you know, in in the course, we do go into more detail about how to create constraints manually and all that stuff. But um, this is really handy. It's kind of done all of that for us right here. So the next thing to do is to punt this into the new RBD uh, solver node that runs in line here in SOP. So let's start on that RBD bullet solver. And you can see that um, it has all these different inputs, geometry, constraint, proxy, collision, and guide sim. We're not going to really be dealing with guide sim, but we're going to be doing uh, some stuff with collisions, uh, obviously, because we're going to have to bring in our golf clubs and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, if we turn this on, uh, you can see that it starts to think about it. And um, if we click play, our geometry is falling down and uh, not really doing much of anything, but you can see that it is starting to react to physics. So let's uh, explore this node a little bit. Our RBD bullet solver, if we dive inside, we've got an area where we can wire in forces. And then if we pop up here to our dot net, you can see that it is there is a dot net in here that just has a bunch of nice defaults that are being exposed to us up here on the SOP level uh, so that we can kind of control some things uh, that have to do with our sim. Um, and it's set up constraints for us and everything. So if I were to do something like go over to this ground tab under solver ground, we could add in a ground plane. If we click play, our sphere falls and lands on the ground. And there isn't enough um, energy in that drop for it to break its glue constraints. Um, but if I were to go over to uh, this constraint section here and look at our glue, you can see our glue strength of one is there. If I were to bring that down to a, a smaller value and then let it drop, it should start to break. And you can see it's starting to do that right there. So for our purposes, um, I'm just going to put the strength back to one. Then let's get our collisions in here. Um, I'm going to go up here and grab the club and the T because I want um, the club and the T to collide with those uh, fracture pieces. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to merge them together. 
and then wire them into this fourth input here where it's expecting collision geometry. So I'm just going to bring this down and because I don't like my wires getting crossed like that, I'm going to throw in a little knot here by option clicking on that stream and just bringing this down a little bit. So here now we've got our collision geo. You can see the T is holding up our ball like that and then our golf uh, club is going to come through and uh, it's actually not updating. You can see our golf club should be, let's see if I can if I go up here, if I highlight our, our geometry or our, our, our bullet solver, you can see our collision geometry appears up here and down here, very small and a little T. But when I click play, nothing is happening. Our, our template, you can see our template club coming in, but our actual club isn't. And that's because we are actually using deforming collision geometry. So I'm going to go over to my solver and go back to collisions. And here you can see it's doing convex hulls, creating animated static objects. We actually want to use uh, deforming static objects. So now I can go back to frame zero. You can see our golf, uh, our golf club comes flying down, and we are back in business here. And it hits our golf ball, and our golf ball starts to break apart and uh, fly across the uh, scene. But in a, it's not quite breaking up just right. And you'd think at this point, oh yeah, we could probably reduce the glue constraint strength and get this to break apart faster. But what I actually want to do, if we look at this, if we just go back and look at our original animation, and I look through our camera, it's going to select the original animation camera from up here. We play this back, we actually kind of go, we have a ramp slow-mo. So really when we're simulating, we want to be simulating at a lower time scale. Um, and this is also going to address another issue. If you notice, the um, ball starts to roll off the tee the first couple frames. Well, because we're going to be doing our simulation in such slow motion, we're not really going to notice that. We could do something like constrain it to the T. Um, it's, it's just not going to be necessary for this type of thing. We could also deactivate it so it doesn't roll and then activate it right before a collision happens. Plenty of ways around that. But um, in this example, what we're going to do is we're just going to change the time scale. So if we go back up here under our solver, our time scale is set to uh, set to one. We want to set it to 0 0.01. So we're going to go a hundredth of the, we're going to scale time by a hundred. Uh, so we're doing like a hundred times slow-mo on this. So if we click play, that ball is more or less staying in place. And because of the way velocity is calculated, that golf club is moving much slower by the time it hits that um, golf ball and the golf ball shatters into a billion pieces. So if I go back here, we can kind of see that that golf ball just gets destroyed into a bunch of pieces, but they're also floating in sort of a slow motion-y kind of way. So that's looking good. I um, mean, I'd say, you know, even at this point, it looks like we, we might be done with this. I think that the pieces could move a little bit slower, so I'm actually going to add a little bit of drag. And luckily for us, drag is one of those things that um, side effects is also added to the top level control of this bullet solver. If we go over to our forces tab here, you can see that there's a little drag uh, checkbox here. So I'm just going to turn that on and um, let's see what the air resistance is set to 0 0.0075. We'll see if that actually does anything. It seems like a really low value. I'm not noticing much, but um, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to refer to the project that I did before, and it looks like I set this to a value of about 0.5. So I'm going to put down a 0.5 in here, and let's just go back into our camera. And that's looking like, that's looking better to me. It's looking like it's moving just a little bit slower, a little bit easier to... A little bit easier to see what's going on. Kind of feels like that ramp slow mower after. Cool. So the next thing we want to do is we want to cache this out. So like we had before this RBD IO cache, um, that's really cool. It's a really handy node, but we don't really need our constraints or anything after this. We just kind of want to have this this nice high res geo, and you can see that um, you know we we get that coming out of this first input. Um, and then we also get our constraint geometry. We also get our proxy geometry if we wanted to. But then this fourth one, we actually get simulation points. And I'm like, well, what are those simulation points? Well, I'm just going to take this. I'm going to borrow this null that we were using before so I can kind of view that. Simulation points uh, come through. I'm just going to split this pane top bottom so I can look at my geometry spreadsheet under inspectors geometry spreadsheet. 
And you can see that these points that are coming out of the rigid, or out of the bullet solver, they are uh, they all have sort of um, these they have all these orientation attributes, pivots, um, and everything that we would need to instance geometry back onto those points. Um, but just because but because they're simply just little tiny points. They should uh, cache and store very much, uh, very, very much less information than we, they would if we were caching this high-res geometry um, every frame. So I'm going to actually run a cache on these points instead, and then what we can do is we can actually instance our original pieces back onto them. So to illustrate this, I'm just going to throw down a transform pieces. Uh, and this is a handy node that SideFX has created for kind of doing this thing. You can take these points and wire them into the template point section here and then grab your original geometry. So this is before the simulation. These are just our fracture pieces as they are statically sitting here. This will know by its name attribute to translate those uh, pieces onto the points in the simulation. And here we have this really nice fast cache this low this lightweight cache that we're going to do when we cache these points out and then we're going to instance our geometry back onto those points so let's just cache out these points real quick so we don't need to have them anymore or we don't need to simulate anymore i'm just going to throw it on a file cache so i'm going to do a file cache instead of this rbd fracture cache and we're just going to wire this in here and i'm going to call this the rbd um, sim points and then i'm going to save it i like to save it into a cache folder next to my file so i'm going to call this cache so i like to use geo folder for a geo that's going into something or going to be used in something um you know like like a initial uh, fracture um, but then i like to use cache to actually store simulations and stuff like that then i like to put it in inside of a couple more folders because usually i have more than one cache so i'm going to go dollar sign os for the operator string then dollar sign hip name to act sort of as my version um and then uh leave the rest as it is and we've changed the project range from 0 to 72 that's good and that should be good i'm just going to click save to disk now if i pull up my cache here you can see our rbd sim points cache we've done this whole cache like this and it is only two megabytes and that's that's incredibly small. I think when I did this before, I was somewhere, when I did this before and I cached out all the geometry, including the high res geometry, it was on the order of uh, like 180 megabytes. And for a small example like this, it's really not that big of a deal. But if you're working with a lot heavier geometry, that's going to be sort of something you're going to want to keep an eye on. And this is a really handy way of doing that. Just ca caching out those little points, it makes things a lot easier to deal with in the end. So I'm going to turn this, uh, check this load from disk option and wire this in here and let's get rid of that null. We don't need it anymore. We don't need this exploded view. And let's just line these up nicely like so. And here we have our cache like that. Um, so the next thing I could do is uh, throw down a null. And we have done the initial fracturing part of this lesson. I'll call this R out RBD sim, and I will give it a color of purple, noting that I like to kind of color my nodes that I'm gonna that have to do with you know the pipeline out to rendering. I like to make them purple. So I'm gonna make this one purple. I'm gonna hop out here and then throw down a new geo node and just kind of store the render geometry in here so that I can, um, you know, if we wanted to render it or export it, we could just have it out here. So I'm just gonna throw down this node. I'm gonna say R and D R, um, RBDs. And then we'll throw in an object merge and just grab from our destruction sim, the out RBD sim, accept. And there we have it. Make this guy purple. And we'll just leave it as is and dive back into our destruction. Cool. So we've done our destruction here. I'm going to just sort of, uh, let's just put a nice little net box around this to note that this is the RBD stuff. So RBD. And I'll give it a nice color. Maybe we'll do this. Uh, maybe we'll do like a yellow. So RBD sim. And now we can take this and do the next part. What we want to do is create debris such as volumetric and particle degree. So we're going to start off with volumetric debris. I'm going to 
going to start this whole thing off with three bold words. Houdini is easy. I am here to tell you that you are in the right place. Stay tuned. Do some particle simulations, some fluid simulations, just all the simulations. Let's just run this again. <laughs> For all of you who are like me, who love computers and graphics and animation, you got this! An introduction to Houdini for motion designers and Cinema 40 artists looking to expand their skills. My apologies for the lame recording. I'm making this up as I go. You really do need to know what this stuff is to do the cool things. Sooner or later, your brain is going to start making connections. You came, you conquered, you saw. And congratulations for making it this far. Why didn't I know this existed? Cheers. I'm proud of you. I'm a little bit emotional now, I'm not gonna lie. Stop being afraid of Houdini. Without further ado, let's let the learning begin.